Hey, lesson three, regression equations. Has anybody used the U.S. regression equations before? Yeah, one person. Okay, so let's talk about them. So here are our learning objectives for this lesson. We're going to estimate design flows with USGS rural regression equations. We're going to interpret the standard error, and then we're going to talk about uh, the urban equations and apply the BDF and the urban regression equations. Um, when we're talking about US regression equations, these are the watershed characteristics that we'll typically find in um, various equations. So we'll be looking at the drainage area. That's pretty important, right? Um, we'll look at channel configuration. Uh, watershed geometry, is the watershed uh, wide and squat, or is it long and narrow, or, you know, what's this watershed look like? And we'll, uh, it might have elevation in there. When would you need to uh, be looking at the elevation, be aware of your elevation? Well, what happens at high elevations, like in Colorado and Atlanta? You get snow. You get a lot of snow. So when you're at high elevations, uh, Colorado USGS equations take the elevation into account. So if you're over some particular elevation, you use a different equation. Um, and land use. Is it forest? Is it urban? Is it agriculture? That kind of stuff. And all of these watershed characteristics impact what? Well, no, uh, I'm ahead of myself. And there are also the meteorological characteristics that we look at in the equations, some equations, not all of them. But rainfall, of course, once you want to know what your rainfall is, right? Uh, snow melt, uh, evaporation, temperature, and wind. Uh, what do you think would be the best variables to help you figure out what the peak flow is? There's one biggie. What do you think that is? Area. Area. Area, yeah, that's the biggest one in the USGS regression equations. Man, you, you might have to get like the fat one. Um, and another one that's not really up there is slope. You'll see slope in a lot of these equations as well. And then all these other characteristics you may or may not see them. It depends on where you are in the country. So here's a typical uh, expression for a regression equation, a, a rural regression equation. And it's just saying that the peak discharge for a given return, return period T. And what do we mean by return period? Can you give me, uh, what is a return period? What's a common? 25 years. 10 years. Yeah, two years. That's all we're talking about. Um, so it could be anything from the two to the 500 year what uh, discharges you're looking for. And the, uh, they show you the regression constants and the independent variables. And the independent variables would be slope or area or elevation or something like that. Uh, so, let's see. Here's a little bit of an example equation. In this example, we have uh, regression of coefficients AB and B2, B1, B2. And in this equation, we're only taking area and slope into account find our peak flow. So um, when you have an equation like that, what you'll see is they will give you um, the variables A, um, sorry, A, customary units, English units, uh, your B1 and your B2 and then your standard error. So if we look at the A coefficient, or uh, yeah, A coefficients. If we look at this equation, A is for the area raised to some power B1, and slope is to the B2. Now, if we look here, you can see for the two year that A is 4.82, and it increases until you get to 399 for the 100 year. What do you think that's telling you? Why is it increasing? It's telling you this is multiplied times the area if raised to a power. But it's saying as that uh, area becomes more and more important, uh, the higher the return period. Because now you're multiplying 399 times your area to some power as opposed to 4.82 times some power. So area is really important in this equation. 
In B1, does it change much? Raised to some power? Not a whole lot, right? So it means uh, it doesn't affect your, uh, this B1 really doesn't affect your discharge too much. But look at B2. This is uh, your slope raised to some power, B2. What's that telling you? As you, as you get a bigger return period, yeah. your slope uh, is, becomes less and less important. Exactly. So for a two year, your flow is, maybe say it's two feet deep for your flow in a two year. And that's pretty important. The slope is now important. But as you get to a hundred year, you might have 10 or 12 feet of water there and the slope becomes less important because the depth is so deep. That's what it's telling you. Now let's look at the standard error. For a two year, your standard error is 62%. Wow. That's a pretty high error rate, isn't it? And look at the others. They're in the 40s. But you know what? For a USGS regression equation to have a standard error in the 40s is pretty dang good. Pretty dang good. And if you think about it, rational method, do you have any idea how good your guess is? Your, your calculation? No? At least this is telling you that, you know, you have a pretty good guess at, like for your tenure of 42%. So think about that. <laughs> so what does that standard error actually mean? Well, um, it's a measure of fit of the observed data. So on gauge watersheds, we can do that. And typically, you'll find um, for gauge data that we use the bell curve or the normal curve. And that's because um, natural phenomena fit very well to the bell curve. You could use a gumball or something like that, um, but they, your, your data would fit too well to it. So what we're saying with a standard deviation or a standard error is that 60, you have a 68% chance of the actual value falling within plus or minus one standard error of the estimate. And we have an 84% chance that the actual value is less than a positive one standard error. So what we're saying there is, now I'm not a good artist, remember that, I'm trying my best. So our Q to peak is 100. And we're saying the standard error is 40, so plus or minus. So if we come down here, this is 60. So what we're saying is that we have a 68% 60, chance that the actual value that we're looking for is within this area, or anywhere from 60 to 140. And we're saying we have an 84% chance that the actual value is less than that 140. So that's pretty good. I mean, you have something to hang your hat on. Any questions about that? So if I told you your standard error was 35 and your Q to peak was 215, would you know how to figure out what the range is? Yeah. Some people shake their head yes. Okay, good. So here are some limitations of the regression equations. So with almost every regression equation you see out there for an area, they will give you the range used to develop that equation. So it might be uh, it could be 10 square miles up to 100 square miles. It could be one square mile up to 500 square miles. But you have to look at that because if your drainage area is outside of that range, you cannot use the equation. You will not get good answers. So always remember to look at what the limitations of that equation are. And you could get inconsistencies near regional boundaries or state boundaries. Uh, and that's if regional boundaries, uh, these equations typically have an area that they're good for. And if you go into the USGS site, or even I think stream stats might show that. Yeah, we have an IPG too. So okay. We have three different areas. Great. So if you're near that and your watershed goes across boundaries, you're going to have to use your judgment to figure out what's going on there. You might want to use both equations for each of those areas. You might want to look at adjacent watersheds that are similar to yours 
that are totally in one region and see if that correlates to what you're seeing at your site. So, and that will help inform you about which equation it is. But that's where you need to use engineering judgment. And remember that these equations are not good for snow melt. You don't have to worry about that so much here. It's usually in the mountains. And flow regulation, meaning do you have uh, a dam upstream? You can't use the equation. Can you, do you have irrigation lines coming off upstream of your, your in point of interest? You cannot use this equation. They don't take that into account. So let's look a little bit at the effects of urbanization on these regression equations. So effects are you increase the impervious area, meaning water can't infiltrate, you know, because you've got so much concrete out there or some other um, impervious surface. You might be decreasing channel lengths, especially in cities. I know in Denver we have a lot of that. We have Cherry Creek that used to meander, and they had um, huge floods around 1900, 1910, and they put a dam upstream in several dams, and then they regularly flow the dam, and they channelized the entire creek all through Denver. Um, so the decreasing your channel length, what's that going to do to your time to peak? going to shorten it, right? It's also going to give you a higher peak, so you can't use that with this, uh, these equations. Um, it will also uh, increase your slopes. If you're decreasing channel length, you're increasing slopes. You could be reducing the roughness. A lot of times uh, these creeks will be channelized, like in LA. The LA River now is a trapezoidal channel. It's all concrete. Um, it, you may increase or decrease storage because of dams or whatever else they're putting in there. And you're increasing drainage density. Why do you think you're doing that in an urban area? How are you increasing? You're having a lot more storm sewers and gutters and things like that. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, all these streets, they're going into storm sewers. The water's going into a storm sewer somewhere and it leads to some creek or river. And that's drainage density. So you'd increase that quite a bit. And so all of these effects in facilitate runoff. They increase the peak flow and your hydrographs become shorter. Okay. So to come up with um, urban regression equations for the USGS, uh, they first came out with those rural ones and then you know, the country started getting pretty urbanized in different areas. So I think it was in the early 80s, FHWA contracted with USGS to come up with an urban approach. And USGS went out there and they found watersheds that had at least 15% commercial industrial residential development. They wanted uh, streams that had 10 or more years of record. Why do you think they wanted that, 10 or more years of record? To get a 10 year storm event get a more a better 10-year storm event for your current storm? Storm? like a better estimate, estimate yeah. yeah so when you're doing statistics you have to have at least 10 points and the more points you have the more reliable your uh, your result will be so USGS always says and even any other method uh, methods we're not teaching in this class you want at least 10 years of record because you have to have some kind of minimum but if you're in the 20 to 30 range, years of record, that's even better. If you're up to 50 or 100, man, you are in a good spot, but that's rare. So um, we want the uh, urbanization to be relatively constant over a period of time. So if you have a watershed uh, in the other course, I'm not going to show it to you here. There is an area outside of DC in Maryland, and, and there's a gauge on the creek there. And it's been in operation since about 1900, that gauge. But over the course of about 80 years, this entire watershed has become urbanized slowly, very slowly. And so when you're looking at that, you cannot just go in and say, OK, I can use uh, the urban regression, regression equation, because those years of records are not from the same population. So a pop, you know, the, the floods you're seeing in 1970 are completely different from the floods you're seeing in 1910 because of that urbanization. You're going to get more flows in 1970 than you did in 1910. So you can't, you're comparing apples and oranges, and you can't do that here. 
there are ways around that to account for that urbanization over time. We're not going to get into it, but um, you take the NHI hydrology course, practical hydrology course, they tell you how to do it. But I want you to be aware of that fact. So if you're going to use this in an area, maybe it's been urbanized for the last 50 years and your, your record is 30 years. Well, then, yes, it's the same population and you can use that. Um, so most of these equations are applicable to watersheds with areas between 0.2 and 100 square miles. Um, some of them go up to about 500. I've seen one that was up to 1,000 square miles. So there you go. Again, you have to look at what the limitations of your equation are. So here's the uh, urban regression equation. And it's just saying the urban uh, peak flow is basically, well, it's kind of like the rural one, except you have this BDF factor. And that's the basin development factor. I'm going to tell you how to figure out what the basin development factor is. Um, and these uh, C1T, C2T, C3T, they are actually in uh, HDS2. I don't think, I think we gave you the answers for what those are, but this is where you find those um, variable numbers. So it's really just taking the rural regression equation and changing the coefficients of it and um, putting in uh, the basin development factor. And you can also see what we have here is we're taking the rural uh, discharge to some coefficient. So what's a basin development factor? It's the quantification of the drainage efficiency. How well is, is, is this uh, watershed promoting runoff because of all the impervious areas or, you know, what's going on? So that drainage efficient, efficiency depends on these four items, channel modifications, channel lining, storm drains, and uh, streets with curb and gutter. And if you have a lot of curb and gutter, that means you're probably urbanized. That's basically what it said. So we're going to look at all of these. The first thing we're going to do, though, is divide up our watershed into three parts. And what you want to do is kind of get the same, about the same area and about the same travel time in each of these sections. So if you have a long uh, watershed, you might divide it up this way. If you have a short, wide watershed, you might do it this way. And you can see the area is not quite, it doesn't look quite the same, maybe it is. But what you're really interested in is the travel time of that water. And, you know, it's not an exact science. Make your best guess, basically. So you're dividing the watershed up into three. And then in each section, you're going to look for channel modifications. So obviously this means, typically, you go out and do a site visit, but maybe you can use Google Earth and check it out that way. So you're going to look at uh, section one of your watershed and you're going to look at the concrete and impervious or other impervious lines and you're going to give it a one if 50 percent or more or more than 50 percent of the main channels been modified has it been straightened has it been concreted what what did they do they put storm sewers in if 50 percent of that sub area of your watershed it has been modified you give it a one otherwise give it a zero then you're going to look at the storm drains. So do you have more than 50% of the secondary tributaries are storm drains? If so, you give it a one, otherwise a zero. And you do this in each area that you're looking at, your three subsections of your watershed. You're looking at these modifications. And then you're looking at curb and gutter. 50 per, more than 50% of the air sub area is urban land use and 50% a street lane has curved and got more than 50 percent. And if that's true, you get rid of one or a zero. But notice in this one, both of them have to be um, satisfied to be designated a one. So you have to have more than 50 percent of urban land and more than 50 percent of street length with curve and gutter. Okay. Can we go through all four? Mm -hmm. Storm drains. Channel lining, that's what I'm missing, sorry. Channel lining is the same thing, more than 50% has a channel lining. Of, 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 of,
for somewhere between 0 and 12 because you have four things you're looking at in three different areas of the watershed in each three areas. So that comes up to 12. Now let me ask you this. Say you had um, curving gutter over 49% of the length of the street. And this says more than 50%. So what would you give it? You'd give it a 0. Well, it's less than 50%, right? Point eight. Huh? Probably something in between point eight. Uh-uh. Our only option is zero or one. Right? That's all we have, zero or one. So when you add up the BDF and you and maybe you got zero for all of this because nothing's fifty percent. And you get zero, is that really true? Is it rural? Yeah. No. So maybe you use some engineering judgment and think, okay. I, I, in my estimation, 30% of this is urbanized. So you bump this up maybe to four. So you have to use some engineering judgment here. So just because it's not less than 50%, maybe it's every category is 49%. Well, I might make some of them a one. What if it's urbanized, but every big development has a good detention as well. So it's, you know, maybe you have all this concrete line channels and stuff, but going the into their own detention are, ponds? But they're all, well, not coming out of detention ponds, then going into these line channels. So the sub catchments are actually being detained before they're let into this urbanized system. So they've uh, uh, attenuated the flows exactly. to pre, mm -hmm. and then you want to use the wall. Because so they're going back to what the rural wants, right? That was the thought, yeah. Yeah. I have I haven't seen that too much where you, everything around yeah. it is that way, but you can't take them into account. If that if the only area you're looking at has attenuated flows and you know it's back to what it used to be before it was developed, sure it gives you more. Okay. So that that's an important concept. You know, just because you got a zero doesn't mean it's not urban. So here's an example. We have an area of 3.1 square miles and a slope of 13.2 feet per mile. And when you use USGS regression equations, notice the slope. It's foot per mile, feet per mile. It's not foot per foot. That's a big difference in your slope. So a lot of people make that mistake. And it messes up your, uh, your calculations. So we also have a BDF factor of six. And we're, we want you to calculate the 100-year rural and urban flow. So this is the equation that we showed you earlier, like a typical uh, regression equation. And these numbers for A, B1, B2, we gave you in that uh, matrix, that table. And so if we plug and chug that, we get a, a discharge of 3,480 cubic feet per second for the 100-year. But for the urban equation, you can see that the BDF is 6, and our, uh, our powers have changed somewhat, quite a bit, actually. And we come up with 3,930 cubic feet per second. So it, it, it makes a difference. It's like a 15% difference, and that's going to affect your pipes, your bridge width lengths what your scour is, it's going to affect everything. So be aware of that. And I think, yes, we're going to go right into um, the workshop. Uh, and it's exercise three. And it shouldn't take too long. We'll probably give you about um, 20 minutes to go through this, and then we'll go through the okay. And I'll come around and uh, give you a healthy day.
need the eight one too. Yeah. Oh, I did. I did. Yeah, I got 18 